Okay, so <clears throat> this is legacy lecture number four from Dr. Fred von Saal from the University of Missouri at Columbia. There's no doubt <clears throat> that Fred is a key night champion of sustainability. He's a total hero of the chemical dimension of sustainability. This will be completely obvious to you from this lecture as it has been for other people that we've seen so far. So it's a very special day and you, you'll get to meet and learn from Professor Frederick S. von Saal, one of our greatest researchers, scholars in the building of the field of endocrine disruption science. The visionary insight, breakthrough science and foundational leadership typified by Professor von Saal have set essential conditions for a sustainable future for our civilization and perhaps even our species. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are primarily responsible for a mutual exclusivity between the chemical enterprise of today and a healthy, prosperous future. This concept is typically poorly understood by and disoriented to chemists. We have a relatively new suite of weird life altering phenomena associated with everyday everywhere chemicals that demand a total rethinking of chemistry's real value to mankind and a reconstruction of the chemical makeup of the chemical enterprise to achieve the possibility, even the possibility of a sustainable future. What follows is a brief personal history of how Dr. Von Saal's career took early shape that I asked him to write for you. So I'm gonna give this now. So after graduating as if I, I'm gonna speak it through as if I was Professor Von Saal. After graduating from New York University, uh, College of Arts and Sciences, I attended intended to go to graduate school in neurobiology and behavior, then called biopsychology. First, I wanted to have some non-academic experience and joined the US Peace Corps. I was posted in Northern Somalia, amazing really, teaching biology in the premier secondary school in the North, general biology, plant biology, mammalian physiology, ecology and evolution, and an advanced human anatomy and physiology to approximately 28 brilliant students. I regarded this as a great experience until a revolution ended with Somalia expelling all Americans at the end of 1969. 69. Pardon? 69. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, 1969. I was then posted in Kenya, where in addition to teaching biology, I flew an orthopedist around to treat injured patients and assist with the surgeries and other treatments. And Fred's quite the pilot. He's been a pilot from a very young person. And um, when he goes on to give a lecture somewhere, he flies, typically flies himself there. I met, I, I met, met him at the airport in a most unusual way when he came to lecture at Carnegie Mellon, I met him at his plane. But the Kenyan government decided to accept Somalia's story that the Peace Corps volunteers were spies and I was arrested and deported in the mid 1970s. This is typical of what happens to Fred as you'll see. After traveling around for a number of months, I was offered a job teaching biology at an international school in Paris, France. This is so much fun that I stayed for two years and then applied to top neurobiology and behavior graduate programs, selecting Rutgers University as the exact program I was looking for, a large multi-department group of faculty with the ability to choose my focus. I finished my PhD in under four years and won a NRSA NIH postdoctoral fellowship to work at UT Austin's Institute of reproductive biology under the direction of Dr. Franklin Bronson, focusing on the neuroendocrine control of the female reproductive system. Shortly after arriving in Texas, I posed a key, key question to Bronson that you guys have re read about the research results of this question in our stolen future. What if the position of a fetus in the uterus created hormone differences that programmed differentiation of organs and the brain and had life history consequences. 
Bronson thought this was unlikely, but was a very bored thinker and also said that if this was true, it would have a major impact. So he said, go ahead and do the experiment. Our resulting seminal bi uh, biology of reproduction article on the interuterine position phenomenon and its effects on a wide range of ph phenotypes, phenotypes being the observed physical or biochemical characteristics of an organism, altered my career path. I wrote another NIH proposal saying I had changed directions based on these findings and that I wanted to pursue. The grant was awarded and I, uh, to start a 43 year, 1976 to 2019 continuous run of having, having federal and also foundational grant support. That's a huge um, salute to, uh, the, that's very, very, very hard to do. A critical part of science is the technology available to use. So I spend it, spent a number of years developing a highly sensitive and specific RIA. Could you translate RIA, Fred? I, I wanted to ask Radio you. Immunoassay in, uh, that's used now as ELISA's to oh. replace the radioactivity, but we didn't have ELISA's then. We relied uh, on radio ligands. Gotcha, thank you for estradiol and testosterone. And then with great grad students and my uh, Missouri, University of Missouri colleague, Wade Walshans, developed a set of assays to determine the free and bound fractions of steroids in blood. These new assays allowed us to measure steroid and serum from individual mouse fetuses. This showed that the large differences in phenotype were related to minute differences in sex steroids during sexual differentiation. A theme, of course, that pervades absolutely everything that we've been looking at uh, uh, in the endocrine disruption section of this class. Uh, we were studying the role of plasma proteins in regulating uptake of estrogenic chemicals to human breast cells. We happened to include bisphenol A, BPA in an experiment and found that it, similar to other itch, another estrogenic drug, diethylstilbestrol that we heard about yesterday eat last evening from Dr. Hunt, had low affinity for sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG. We were easy, easily able to calculate the difference this would make in the potency of BPA and decided to test whether the low doses 22 and 20 micrograms per kilograms per day or parts per billion per day, we calculated should be bioactive in mouse fetuses. And we found that BPA at the low doses tested altered male mouse reproductive organs, similar to DES and estradiol and other estrogens. Uh, something is and okay, so we're going to do this from here now because I've got something let me bring. I mentioned this in passing at a talk I gave at a public meeting at the National Academy of Sciences in DC in 1995 because I did not know that BPA was one of the highest volume chemicals in commerce. The reaction was swift and consisted of a cold, unplanned phone call with a number of industry ex executives from Dow, General Electric, Shell, and DuPont, who said they were very disturbed by my presentation of data about BPA, that they wanted my raw data, and they were generally making it clear that this was a big issue to them. I responded that this call is over, and I hung up. I called the University of Missouri Chief Counsel and told him I had really irritated these guys, but did not know why, but that I would certainly find out. Thus began my journey to defensively learn all that I could about BPA and about 70 publications about BPA later. I know that it is fantastically dangerous substance that is capable of altering phenotypes across the animal kingdom, including humans. Well, having said that, 
let me please now uh, stop sharing. Did I start sharing? Oh, I didn't share the screen, doesn't matter. Um, let me turn the, the uh, my mistake. Let me turn uh, the, um, turn, turn the uh, podium over to Professor Von Saal. If you begin by sharing your screen and not make that same mess up, Fred will be good. Uh, okay. Got to get rid of yours. There I go. Yep, you're on. Well, thank you for the very nice introduction, uh, Terry. I um, want to make sure that you understand that while I'm talking about the mechanisms of endocrinology that we now have shown have falsified the way industry and the regulatory agencies that are supposed to govern them uh, regulate these chemicals. I'm gonna start off in a weird way based on some of the information Terry just gave you in terms of how I got to the point where it was so clear to me, even given my training in endocrinology, how absolutely insane the principles of toxicology are <laughs> when it comes to regulating anything relating to the endocrine system. And Fred, if I might say, Fred, you might want to go to uh, full screen with your presentation because we can see quite a lot of your background information. Yeah, great. Okay, is that better? Yeah, that's what we want. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So I don't want to scare you with this. This is kind of a general outline that you could maybe survey later, but it starts out with what I'm sure you know that endocrine disruptors can be a single chemical, a mixture of chemical that interfere with any aspect of hormone action. And that's sort of the way I approach this. And my focus has been on development because it's a period when the fetus is relatively defenseless. I mean, it doesn't have liver enzymes, immune system, all kinds of feedback systems that allow for modulation of chemicals we're exposed to. The fetus doesn't have them. And hormones act by receptors. And we have been beating on toxicologists to tell them that's a different world. You have to think about that. Receptors act at low doses. They're tremendously amplified. Those responses you know, occupy a small number of receptors. And I'm not going to give you all of the math and anything like that. I'll just show you through some examples some of this. The consequence being that low doses of these chemicals not predicted by toxicology are bioactive and high doses do different things. Those are non-monotonic dose response curves and life stage is important. And I'm sure you've seen lots of pictures like this. You take a hit early in life and uh, at week six and with, or three or four with thalidomide, you lose arms and legs. Well, that doesn't happen at week 10. Uh, and the reproductive system is differentiating at the end of the early fetal trimester and into the second of human pregnancy. And that's what I'm going to be focused on. And this really gives you an example of that in the mouse, this period of sexual differentiation, organogenesis, where the embryo, the pre-organ developing mass starts forming organs and is called a fetus. And the first thing that really starts developing is the brain and the reproductive system and the heart, of course, first. Uh, in the human, this is happening week six to about 22. And if you've heard 
Pat Hunt talk about DES, you know that after 22 weeks of pregnancy, exposure to DES didn't have any harm that to the reproductive system anyway. So I stumbled onto something and uh, this may look like a lot of information, but there are only a couple things you need to focus on. First of all, back in the 1970s, we really didn't understand the role of estrogen in development. We thought sexual differentiation was driven by testosterone. And here we had females that were, we could see were masculinized. And if you look at a 2M female down, down here, and she's between two males. And that's a completely random event. And she has 2.5 nanograms per mil of testosterone. This is where this assay that I developed with an incredibly high specific activity iodinated ligand that nobody else had done. They had no way to go into individual fetuses or even large numbers. And and measure hormones. And we microed this down to literally five microliters we could measure steroids. So technology drives science, it's, it's incredible. And then we could measure the free level and I'll come back to that. So if you look at females between females, they're a part per billion, they're one nanogram per mil on average less. And the guys in the middle, the one MFs, they're sort of intermediate, they're your average animal. And if you study them, you're sort of, a, you're missing the tails of the distribution. So we focused on that at the beginning. Then I'll tell you, subsequently, we learned, oh my God, we really <laughs> didn't see this coming. And two F males have 23 picograms of total estradiol, more than 2M males, because we didn't think testosterone at the time would mean much. A little, what could a little extra testosterone mean to the male? They had enough, they were males. What this calculates to, because we developed dialysis assays and we found 0.02%, one in 500, estradiol molecules is actually bioactive. There's all this estrogen and everybody wonders, doesn't it kill the fetuses? Doesn't it do all these terrible things? No, you produce huge amounts of binding protein and you sequester practically all of it. And the free concentration difference between these two males is 0 0.05 parts per trillion or picograms per mil. And I literally had colleagues laugh at me and say, and I quote, what the fuck are you talking about? That's crazy. What could that do? And so we moved on and we were looking intensively at the role of plasma binding proteins in modulating estrogens, particularly focusing on pregnancy was one of the things that we were doing in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. And one of the important things to show you down here on the bottom left, if a cell has no receptor, hormone can dialyze into it, but nothing happens. And the hormone that dialyzes into a cell with a receptor is going to cause a response. But is it the total hormone that I've been talking about that I just measured there or the free hormone? Well, if a hormone is attached to a hydrophilic protein, it can't transport across the placenta. It has to, and this is all first order kinetics. You know, there's binding and there's, there's an on rate and an off rate and but in the mouse feet, it's a very small amount is free. Same in human feet, a little higher than 0.2. And you have low affinity albumin binding and high affinity sex hormone binding globulin binding. We were studying this. 
So when I say we could see 0.05 picograms per mil was bioactive, that was directly measured. If you go to a doctor and they say, here's your free hormone level, it's based only on a ratio to sex hormone binding globulin that's less than 50% of the binding of hormone, estrogens or testosterone. So it's a bogus number. We have real numbers. Okay, so this is very important because these are human data. The range of these different steroids is different for each steroid with estradiol being the most potent, testosterone being hundreds of times higher in the ranges it operates in. Uh, but you look at estradiol, the range is less than 10 picograms per mil. And uh, cortisol, of course, you can get a severe stress response and it'll spike to hundreds of picograms per mil. But we're all in the part per trillion range. So what did we do in mice? We took these females from different intrauterine positions and said, at the time, again, we weren't focusing on estrogen. We started focusing on testosterone. And we said, well, the ones between males, are they responding to more testosterone? Because males, if the way you sex them is the males are bigger than females. But there's a lot of variability in females and also in males. Some females are hard to measure. And lo and behold, the difference was whopping. And uh, you can see that if you're a female between males, you have a much more masculinized space between the anus and the genital. This is the perineal tissue that becomes uh, the space to the scrotum in the male. And uh, this is also associated with in males, which showed the same thing we didn't look at at the time, but other people have small penis size. If you have a small anal genital distance, you have a small penal volume. So I'm not gonna go through all this, but one of the consequences of what I had posed to my advisor is what if there are life history consequences? So, okay, they have masculinized genitalia to be between females. They also, in, as density levels increase, they start attacking other females and become the dominant females. But when you overreactomize these two types of females and put them with a male, practically all the males mate with the feminized female. They just ignore these females. We know that androgens delay puberty, estrogens accelerate puberty. That's been shown experimentally over and over and over. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, there are women that have 32, 33, 34-day estrous cycles, other women with 21-day estrous cycles. 100% of the long-cycling mice, rats, gerbils, other animals that have been looked at, are from a position between males. 100% of the really short, regular cyclers are born between females. Androgens disrupt menstrual cycles. Stunning finding, which we have no molecular understanding of, but we've seen it in hamsters, rats, and mice. And uh, I have a publication on that I show here. The 2M females produce male bias litters, and their females tend to be more likely to be by, by a male and therefore more likely to be like the mother, but it's completely non-genetic. These two F females produce female bias litters. And so their babies tend to be like them. But again, it's due to a random event because positioning in the uterus has no genetic component to it. We, we showed mathematically that's true. And then the life history thing, the two M females androgenized as fetuses 
cease reproducing early compared to their sisters who had lower testosterone. So does this have any relevance to humans? So Luma went to the Finnish literature from the 18th century to the 19th century, and they keep records on everything. And she found this, all of the evidence from women who had been born co-twin with a male and their life history was recorded in these towns. And lo and behold, they had a lower probability of ever marrying if they were born with a male co-twin. And their lifetime production of babies, their fecundity, which is their you know, determination of reproductive success, was dramatically lower. And then you might say, well, being born and growing up with a male twin can change you. You have exactly the same data if the male died at birth and the female was born fetally with a male co-twin, but postnatally had no male co-twin, you have the same data. So you have the same thing in males and females. So anal genital distance because of the animal research has become a huge subject in human biology. Uh, Professor Shana Swan, who just published this book, Countdown about sperm count, and I'll show you why, is now using this as a core marker of the degree to which fetuses are androgenized or deandrogenized. And the reason is Neil Skakibach produced a concept called testicular genesis syndrome because what he sees is that low sperm count, hypospadias, that is the urethra coming out the side of the penis instead of the end, undescended testes, which cryptorchidism, impaired sperm production, low sperm production, uh, abnormal nurse cell of sperm, Sertoli cell function. All of these are predicted by anogenital distance. And there's this broad spectrum. All of these connect and correlate with each other you have one, you likely have all of the other. These are human data. The mouse data are in fact incredibly informative. So this is actually critical uh, in terms of changing the way physicians think about this. So to take you through what I did, you have to kind of dive a little into early embryology Sorry about that. But this is a uh, about six week human embryo. An embryo is before organogenesis, and then we call them fetuses. What's the organs become identifiable? And in the mouse, this is about gestation day 15, and they deliver on day 19. And of course, humans have about uh, you know, 38 to 40 weeks of pregnancy. So these are testes, and then you have this duct, this male duct called a Wolfian duct that comes out, a bud branches off, becomes the semen producing seminal vesicle. It dives into the urogenital sinus here and connects with the urethra. And it dives through here and is called the ejaculatory duct. Now this blue line, the two sides of that coalesce together and dive into the back of the urethra and uh, you know, connect to it. And those would form, the bottom part would form the vagina. This would be the uterus. This would be the fallopian tubes and these would become ovaries. The thing is that the male produces uh, enough Mullerian inhibiting hormone to kill off this blue stuff. But estrogen 
blocks that. And this is a particularly sensitive area to estrogen. And so you can see persistence of this terminal part of the female duct stuck in the middle of a male prostate. And it's called the utriculus. And it's a signature of high estrogen exposure. So I'm gonna focus on the prostate and the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle comes from a different embryonic duct, the Wolfian duct, from the urogenital duct, which is a different embryonic organ. So what we saw in males is exactly what you'd think. We were very happy about this. The males between males had bigger seminal vesicles than the males between females. The only problem is when we gave them dihydrotestosterone, the difference went away. We said, oh, that's really interesting because in endocrinology, you know, testosterone comes into these cells is converted to a tenfold higher activity hormone, 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone that activates androgen receptors. The problem is 5-alpha DHT, it's not, I mean, I've shown this, but so have maybe 20, 30 other publications. Estrogens inhibit this enzyme. Oh, so jeepers, the high estrogen males are getting inhibited from having this but if you give DHT that takes this whole thing away, then the 2F and 2M look exactly the same. So it looks like the difference is really that testosterone we know enhances 5-alpha reductase, estrogen decreases it. This is a combination effect of both of these hormones doing something and leading to a difference in the functioning of this organ, not only the development, but the way the organ functions through life, because these are data from the adult. So it's not only a weight difference, it's a functional difference. So then we looked at the prostate. And when we first saw this, I, I saw this, I said, somebody screwed up the coding. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> you got to redo it because the whole prostate literature was that there was essentially no prostate if you gave estrogens to males. You kill it. And so when I showed this at a uh, basic urology research meeting, people just said, that's nuts. <laughs> Nobody believed it. So uh, one of the things we showed here that's really critical is not only was the prostate bigger, but we had increased fourfold the number of androgen receptors. Well, why is that important? These aren't my work. These are from a transfection study where you put in a receptor at different numbers and look at the response of the cell you're putting it in. And if you increase fourfold the receptor number, what happens is you increase linearly the capacity of the cell to show an effect. In other words, you're ampli the potency of a chemical is actually directly related to the total number of receptors present in that cell. And if you increase receptor number by fourfold, you're increasing the response potential by fourfold. So one of the things we did as a follow-up experiment, we said, well, everybody thinks we're nuts. And we increased, because we had the assays to do this, where we could measure not only the total estradiol in the serum of babies whose mothers were implanted with capsules of estradiol, and by the way, we used a 1F MF male. We delivered the males by hand, selected the ones between males and females because they were intermediate. So we didn't have to deal with a lot of variability. 
which increased our power. So what we showed was a 50% increase in free serum estradiol from 0.21 to 0.32 picograms per mil, a tenth of a picogram per mil increase, as opposed to the difference due to intrauterine position, which was half that amount. Well, this amount of increase gave us almost a six-fold increase in androgen receptors and also an increase in prostate weight. We demonstrated experimentally that this was prior finding wasn't just a fluke. So here's what's true for males. It's not that different from females. The 2M males show a lot of aggression, so did the females. But the 2F males want to have sex. They're not aggressive. But if you put them with a female, the 2F males will ejaculate six or seven times. These guys are duds. They're studs, but they're duds. And uh, they practically, if you can get them to ejaculate, you're lucky. And then they're interesting. They act more like they actually parent babies. The 2F males, they kill babies to get the females to mate with them and start to go back and cycle. All they're interested in is sex. They're also hyperactive. And there's a lot of brain changes that go on between these two males. And again, the 2F males, the estrogenized males, have enlarged prostates. And for those of you who are young, you will realize at some point, if you are a male, that's a very bad thing. <laughs> You're going to say, oh, crap, maybe I have an enlarged prostate. Because you'll have all kinds of problems. So the important point here, what we're doing is accounting wow for variability in the sensitivity of people in the population to exposures. If you have upregulated receptor numbers in cells and altered enzyme activity, you're going to respond differently to hormones. And you're going to be at one of the tail ends of this and not really covered by anybody in the regulatory system. And the, it's, it's, the sort of take home message is the action in terms of understanding what's really going on and what's safe. And it's a mandate to the regulatory system. You don't focus on the average person. You predict the most sensitive person. You protect them from being harmed. That is not happening. So along with this experiment, we actually didn't just give this low dose shown in yellow that I just showed you the data from. We gave higher doses. And when you got up over a picogram per mil of free estradiol, uh, then lo and behold, you actually block prostate development, which is what the whole field up to then using high doses said would happen. But we realized, you know, if we just published this one study, which we could certainly have done, people are going to come after us with chainsaws. So we spent an extra year doing a follow-up study with diethylstobesterol, the most studied. There were maybe 500 articles about it at that time. And what we showed is when you get to a low dose, a 0.2 microgram per kilogram dose, you're stimulating prostate. And when you get to the high dose commonly used in toxicological studies, some of which used 1,000 micrograms directly to babies. And in toxicology, uh, they all saw that 
you know, it pretty much kills the prostate. And then what you do is using linear kinetics, say, well, this would be the no effect dose. And you divide that, the FDA would divide that by 100 and say, this is completely safe. They would never test that, but that's what they would say. And of course, that is in the maximum range of harm. So when I showed this to Lynn Goldman, the assistant administrator at the EPA, her response was, oh my God. And uh, so it wasn't like people didn't get this, uh, but the regulatory system would not change. So what's critical here is we're gonna be talking about BPA and other toxicological study approaches. In BPA, the top dose given in a regulatory study that determines its safe level to be 50,000 micrograms per kilogram per day, not two. They gave 1.25 grams per kilogram per day to these animals. They were in the gram range. We're seeing human exposure is about a nanogram or more per day. And there are effects of BPA at point, at, excuse me, two femtograms per mil. So, you know, we're talking a difference here of a thousand trillion between two approaches. It, it's it's just absolutely stunning. We're not on the same planet here. Um, hmm. Come on. Aha. So one of the things that a colleague of mine, Chandra Gupta, did is she went ahead and did the same experiment we were doing with mice and gave them this very low dose of DES that the FDA complete, considered completely safe. And she showed that it caused about an eightfold increase in androgen receptors, sorry. And also the same kind of increase in prostate weight. So these are fetal exposures and adult outcomes. So you have a permanent derangement of the sensitivity of the prostate to the same level of hormone these two animals can experience the same levels of testosterone. This will show a dramatically amplified response and it'll do that forever. And that is a clear risk factor for prostate disease, including cancer and death. We then did serial section reconstruction of a a uh, mouse at birth exposed to a high dose, this high dose 200 micrograms per kilogram of DES, as opposed to a control mouse. And you see buds coming out here, and I'll show you another picture. These are the ventral buds, the dorsal buds. These are some lateral buds. They become the glands, and these are the seminal vesicles coming in. And what you see is DES killed the prostate. There, is, there are no prostate ducts. They're just these line of periurethral glands coming out of the base of the uterus. And this organ here, this estrogen caused persistence of the Mullerian duct, the female duct system, which is called the utriculus and gets trapped in the dorsal part of the urogenital sinus, part of the collicular region of the prostate and makes the prostate huge and also compresses down on it, interfering with the urethra. 
So one of the interesting thing is we have this incredible literature on DES, and we're developing this literature on what is really a sister chemical. And we see tremendous concordance between BPA and DT DES. And one of the common features they have is they don't uh, uh, bind to sex hormone binding globulin. And so they pass through blood bypassing the control barrier that modulates how much stuff in your blood can dialyze through cells and get to receptors. Another thing that really has not been looked at, although it's been published, is there is this 4-methyl-2,4-bis-hydroxyphenolpentonine called MBP that's produced in the human about one hundredth of BPA is metabolized in the liver to MBP, which has a thousand fold the potency of BPA. And it's found in fish and other species. So it's not just humans that have the ability to metabolize this. So at this time, in the uh, early 1990s, we were looking at these issues of how plasma proteins modulate the ability of chemicals to get into cells. And it was doing these studies with human breast cancer cells as the target and human blood you know, incubated in them and we'd put chemicals in and see, uh, did they displace radioactive estradiol already attached to the receptors or did they not? And some didn't, like octophenol was really soaked up in the blood and looked not to get in very well. Well, BPA lit up our interest because it was like, wow, this is like DES. This doesn't seem to bind to a sex hormone binding globulin. So we didn't know anything about it. But uh, once industry came after me, first thing I did is I took out a million dollar uh, frivolous suit umbrella policy that Clinton had and saved him uh, money in a suit by Jennifer Flowers when he was misbehaving sexually, as uh, you know, he was prone to do. Anyway, uh, but that was reported that he had this policy. There was this in inexpensive policy. I said, I got to get one of those because I knew they were coming after me. And why are you worried about BPA? Well, polycarbonate is links of chains of BPA. And the quality of the BPA depends on the integrity of how it's made and how much cross-linking ends up occurring and all kinds of things that you guys probably know a lot more about than I do. But what you do know about is the process of hydrolysis that, you know, under heat and, uh, you know, acids and stuff, this stuff hydrolyzes. And that is, it breaks apart. So you have a can of soup and the can is lined with BPA. You're going to be drinking BPA when you drink, uh, when you eat your soup. So what we quickly found out is there's a heck of a lot of this stuff out there. It's one of the 50 highest volume chemicals in production in the world. It's in everything. As a matter of fact, you can't find out what it's in. Well, we do know from research that it's in a lot of medical equipment. It's in dental equipment. We've shown that downstream of smokestacks, spewing BPA out of them, streams have tenfold higher levels of BPA than streams that are not near smokestacks. We've shown that there's 20 milligrams per gram 
coated on the print surface of receipt paper and that it's like invisible talcum powder. It comes off onto your hand and you transfer it everywhere. Uh, you are just constantly loaded with it and it goes through your hand incredibly quickly. Within one minute, if you just hold it and then you start measuring the hand, you see the amounts you measure start going down because it's so quickly, it's a lipid, it goes right through the skin barrier. And it lines uh, vegetable and meat cans and stuff, but it does not line fresh fruit cans because uh, the tin uh, blocks oxidation of the fruits. So it's not necessary to line cans with this stuff, although the can industry will say it is. So what about medical equipment? You know, 13 years ago, CDC published this, that medical equipment in a neonatal intensive care unit was embalming babies by using polyvinyl chloride that has phthalates in it to soften it and bisphenol A in it to give the tubing and the medical equipment tensile strength. So they're both in there and they're getting co-embalmed with these different chemicals. But you can see that the natural population, this is based on thousands of people in the National Health Survey, uh, are in the uh, you know one to three nanogram per mil range of exposure based on monitoring their urine, sort of an integrated output of conjugated BPA. So going on, you know, we started focusing on low doses and I called up the head of the National Toxicology Program, George Lucere in uh, 1989, excuse me, 1999. And I said, George, we really need to have a workshop on what we can define low doses at because industry keeps trying to throw mud at this issue. And he said, absolutely. So I wrote a proposal. They immediately put together, funded the meeting and there was a big low dose meeting and the URL for this report that just says, yes, there are low doses and there are industry papers that are just statistical nightmare, of complete confusion and nonsense. And, uh, you know, so uh, it was not a happy thing. And uh, there are actually two doses uh, that are types of doses that are low doses. The other second one is critical. And that is if you show an effect below the lowest dose tested in a toxicology study. And that lowest dose was used as a reference for calculating the safe or reference dose or acceptable daily intake. You reset that. You, that, in, that safe dose has to be changed. That's never happened, of course, but that's <laughs> what the idea is. So one of the first things we saw that industry called me up and went ballistic about was we said, you know, in addition to damage to all the rest of the reproductive system, including the prostate, seminal vesicles and epididymis and all of that, these guys are producing less sperm in adulthood because they were exposed to BPA as a fetus. Well, here's some follow-up references for you, you know, urine BPA in relation to semen quality. These are human studies. Okay. BPA and declining male sexual function, lower libido, uh, sex hormones being low, uh, and uh, all kinds of things. And data from the US on astronomical workplace exposures so there are human studies that have followed this and the FDA ignores 100% of them. They, do, they don't recognize them. 
even if they're government CDC studies. It's just, how do you do that? Anyway, um, so another thing then that was important to show is that BPA was just like DES and estradiol. And it did to the prostate, it elevated androgen receptors. This supposed safe dose at the time, 50 micrograms per kilogram per day, a thousand times lower than this 50 microgram dose, 50,000 microgram dose that had, was the lowest dose ever studied by the government. She said, you know, we're finding it does just what all these other estrogens do in the prostate. And these, again, it was about a six-fold increase in androgen receptors. Well, that's a dramatic change in response. So here's what prostate differentiation looks like, just to give you a little clue. And you can see you have the bladder and the urogenital sinus has this tube running through it. And then from this tube, due to the action of testosterone and estradiol in these mesenchyme cells, it causes budding of prostate glands. And I'm gonna show you these glands coming out in treated and untreated animals. And this is the cross-sectional area shown here with the mesenchyme surrounding some long ducts that become the peripheral ducts and shorter ducts that become the uh, proximal ducts. These are the ones that cause benign prostatic hyperplasia. These are the ducts in which you end up with cancer. It's highly specific. So this shows the formation of these ducts during the last couple of days of pregnancy in a rat or a mouse. And Barry Timms, my long-term colleague from the University of South Dakota, skilled developmental anatomist, developed the computer software, which is now used for the visible man and all kinds of stuff where you serial section things. And the computer lines them all up and does morphometrics on it, gives you the volumes and size and everything. So these are the dorsal ducts, the green, the lateral prostate ducts, and uh, these are the ventral ducts, okay? So these are the most, the dorsal and lateral are the most important for the human. The human ventral ducts become vestigial, actually. So here's what happens if during this time, I just showed you day 14 to 18, during the time of sexual differentiation of the prostate. Here's a normal prostate. This is the bladder neck and where the bladder connects to the urethra. You see, it's nice and big. You got ventral ducts, lateral ducts. These are the anterior, the big anterior prostate ducts. Look what happens at the prostate, excuse me, at the bladder neck. It gets squeezed. You have massive hyperplasia of the ductal systems due to the drug estradiol. It's estimated 2 million women get pregnant every year because they miss pills, not because it's a bad drug that it doesn't work. It's that women, particularly young women, don't take the pills reliably. So they have breakthrough pregnancies, they get pregnant on it, and doctors are telling them, take a look at this. Absolutely nothing happens. There's no data, there's no evidence that final estradiol or any other estrogen is gonna hurt you. Now we, of course, know DES cause cancer and infertility, and all kinds of horrible stuff, but they ignore that. So here's BPA. Look at the gross malformation. This strips off all of the ducts. Here's a normal urethral pathway. Look at these massive deformities that are occurring here. This is gross teratology. 
That's gross abnormalities. But what really intrigued us was like, holy mackerel, these guys have compromised urethras. So look, this is a collage from a review that I just published with Laura Vandenberg. And the top part here shows you, this is an untreated mouse, developmentally, fetally exposed to BPA. Then in adulthood, we elevate their estrogen levels again. It's called a two-hit model because during aging, men show a creeping increase in estradiol and a creeping decrease in testosterone, the you know, opposite of women. So what do you see here? These guys die because we can't catheterize them because of a bone in the fetus. There's no way to get a catheter into them. You have a monster urine retention. It back flow, because it kills the kidneys. That's called hydronephrosis. Their prostates show profound hyperplasia Trans, which could be transitioning into cancer. They didn't live long enough. And they also show prostatitis, leukocytic invasion, which is not surprising given all the other chaos going on. These guys are a metabolic nightmare. This is data from Anna Soto's lab. What's going on in the mammary gland with fetal exposure to very low doses of BPA and the answer is massive hyperplasia of the ducts, the terminal duct areas where cancer forms. There's massive increase, high, high risk factor for breast cancer in women. Pat Hunt's data in 2003 caused a huge storm showing here's the spindle lineup during uh, just before cytokinesis and uh, cell division in a oocyte during early life and a complete disorganization of this. And she also found in sperm that it disorganizes the uh, uh, recombinant, the, the DNA lineup systems, the chromosomal systems. One of the interesting things here is this is from Sukue et al. They showed that in adulthood, BPA would do to sperm production exactly what fetal exposure did permanently. And the inhibition occurred at exactly the same dose in the adult rat that we showed was effective in fetal mouse. Well, quite amazing. So this study is interesting because of this concept of selective estrogen receptor modulator. All of these are suggestive that this is acting as an estrogen, doing what estradiol would do. Here, they load up the animal with estradiol and then start increasing the dose of BPA. And they're looking at the connections between neurons called synaptic spines. That's what allows neurons to talk to each other. And if you disconnect enough of them in the hippocampus, which is where this is, you end up with senility. Your brain cells aren't talking to each other. So in the hippocampus, against an estrogen background, BPA is an anti-estrogen. And then over here in rat pituitary cells at two femtograms per mil, you, excuse me, you start and then you go to 20 femtograms per mil, 0.023 picograms per mil. You stimulate and st the activation of a critical regulatory pathway called the estrogen-related uh, 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 pathway that uh, it's part of MAP. It's now known as MAP kinase. 
uh, and it's a kinase cascade series that I'll show you a little more data. And if you have it given with estrogen, it blocks estrogen action in activating this ERK-1-2 pathway. So the point here is that there are drugs like tamoxifen that are prototypical selective estrogen receptor modulators. Sometimes they act as an agonist, stimulant, and sometimes an antagonist. They're very complex, and there isn't a single action across all cells. We've also shown that during fetal life and exposure in of pregnant females to doses of BPA or a thinyl estradiol permanently upregulate the expression of the estrogen receptor alpha gene, the estrogen receptor beta gene, and the aromatase gene, which is CYP19. CYP19. So this looks a little complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. Testosterone should come in here. It actually has two options. It's metabolized to estrogens in the cell through aromatase, as testosterone's converted to estrogen, or it's converted by 5 liporeductase to DHT. And then it activates, DHT activates the androgen receptor, and you have growth and proliferation. The problem with estrogens, they bind to the estrogen receptor and they upregulate the number of androgen receptors. They block DHT action, but they increase the amount of endogenous estradiol that's present there. So not only are you getting a hit by BPA or DES or a thinyl estradiol or estradiol or whatever you're putting in here, you're also increasing intracellular estradiol that's converting uh, aromatase is producing extra amounts of. The consequence that we see here in studies we've published and others have published is that story, stimulatory growth factors are increased and inhibitory growth factors that would bottom out proliferation, uh, they're decreased. So uh, these effects are permanent. You have deranged these systems permanently. So we think epigenetics is at the core of this. And one of the things we focused on, I'm sure that you've read a little bit about epigenetics. There are lots of different things. There's RNAs, there's chromosomal coding and stuff. So we're just focusing here on one of the simpler aspects that you can hypermethylate in the promoter region of a gene in guanosine, cytosine rich regions called CG islands. If you methylate those regions, you tend to shut off gene activity. If it's not hypermethylated, those genes are Active. So this would maybe be an oncogene, a cancer-causing gene. And this is a normal cell proliferation controlling gene. What if you give a chemical that alters them? And BPA, we just published uh, about a year and a half ago that in fetal mesenchyme, we're altering the men's enzymes, the D, uh, methylating enzymes and demethylating enzymes in here. And what can happen is you demethylate the gene that should be methylated and methylate a gene that you really need to control cell cycle systems. And the system goes completely crazy and you end up with tumors and disease. So just Terry, how much time do I have? I don't know. Is that okay. Um, 
anyway, uh, just to go on, uh, so there's a permanent increase. What have we shown in prostate glands and volumes at physiological doses of these estrogen chemicals? Uh, the increased receptors for both androgen and estrogen. Uh, and um, particularly, this is occurring in a cell type basal cells that we think are the pro tumor cells in prostate. And this is being mediated by uh, epigenetic mechanisms. At pharmacological doses, everything that I just told you, the opposite occurs. So I spoke without turning on my <laughs> uh, turning on my uh, sound. Um, we have we have about five minutes left, but honestly, I would just like you to finish anyway. If it goes a bit over, uh, no 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 problem. Please finish. Okay, I'll, I'll quickly finish up. Uh, so hormones act at low doses; they cause tremendous a binding event causes tremendous amplification through these cascade. Uh, kinase pathways, uh, and that they occur by binding at very low receptor occupancy. 1% of total estrogens occupied gives you 50% res proliferation response in breast cancer cells. And that's because the system is tuned between the one in 10% occupancy range to give you a perfect proportional increase in uh, receptor occupancy with increased in dose, which doesn't happen if you've saturated receptors. You have to see a change in receptor to see a change in response. And the other thing is this receptor crosstalk that estrogens bind to androgen receptors at 100-fold higher and block them. Well, you get non-monotonic dose response curves because of conflicting events going on. Here you have ER beta binding to one nanomole and inhibiting calcium entry into a beta cell. And here you have at 100 micromole 100 nanomole binding to ER alpha, which has a higher, a, a lower affinity, needs more to activate it. And it causes the opposite response. It stimulates calcium entry. If all you look at very high doses, it doesn't look like anything's happened. And uh, you miss the fact that there's all this action going on and you have receptor upregulation and downregulation. You have genes that over a tenfold range are activated and then completely inhibited. And just like estradiol, BPA at a hundredfold higher will start blocking androgen receptors and everything. And it's this different in affinity that for ER beta and alpha that accounts for what appears to be a non-monotonic dose response curve. So we wrote about this, all of this, a number of years ago. And I think I'll just sort of end up saying I have some slides you can look at. And uh, you know, there's clearly the assumptions used by regulatory agencies are simply false. And uh, we need more attention to the actual science. And I'll just let you know that the recent response of the FDA to data they have and we have of clear low dose effects is a low dose should be seen, which means increasing dose and test some substance has to cause an increase in effect. And that means there can never be a non-monotonic dose response curve. And this was in a study with a 10,000-fold range of doses. We see inverted U curves with 10-fold range of doses. And they say the effect should occur in males and females. 
they don't seem to realize that, you know, males and females are different. They have different hormones and they don't respond to treatments the same. That's why there's a women's health initiative at NIH. Uh, so these are all of my colleagues and students and postdocs and stuff who actually did all this work. And this is an industry ad from a number of years ago that they finally realized was not a good idea and they pulled it. So I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry, I went over. Well, no, no, Fred, um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for this. Um, uh, because of the time, we will not have questions, but let me just say to the class that I think that you can see why uh, all of you for sure are carrying BPA in your bodies and excreting it in your urine. For 95% of you, if based on a study a number of years ago, it's measurable. But even if it's not measurable, it's there. It's just below the level of detection. And so having this chemical uh, in your body, in your urine, in your blood, having an incredible number of roots in with the effects that Dr. Van Sal has shown you um, correlates very well uh, on the basis of this chemical alone with, with what you've learned from Dr. Swan. Our sperm counts in Western man uh, is absolutely catastrophically dropping. And so to take the different pieces of information that you've seen from the different speakers and especially this one and conclude that we can continue with a civilization that's absolutely swimming in BPA uh, defies common sense. I'll simply make that statement uh, as a chemist to you. And um, this has given you, I think Fred, you've given the students and, and myself. One, one, one thing I've learned guys, if Fred von Sal says something, you listen, you listen. Every time I hear Fred talk, I learn amazing stuff. And we're only scratching the surface of what Fred, Fred can teach us. He is an incredibly brilliant and amazingly deep uh, science, scientist who will take no bullshit from governments that are terrified to actually regulate properly uh, because of the impacts on the economy. So. Fred, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, we are totally blessed to have it. It's recorded, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and if everybody give Fred a virtual clap, we'll close the, the uh, class. And um, next Thursday, we're going to have John McLaughlin, who is one of the mo most amazing early uh, researchers in endocrine disruption science. It's going to be fantastic also, as of all of these talks. Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure to be here.